<laughs> here we go. Where is it? It's here. It's here. Welcome to Teamwork, a better way. The podcast filled with stories, experiences, and insights from leading high-performing team experts. Here are your hosts, Spencer Horn and Christian Napier. <laughs> well, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, one week away from Halloween edition of Teamwork, a better way. I'm Christian Napier, joined by the man in burnt orange, Spencer Horn. Spencer, yeah. how are you? Good, feeling uh, feeling fallish, right? So we got the fall colors on, and and then the uh, the, the Halloween gremlins addled my brain for a moment there. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. You've been all over the place. Uh, where did you just come back from? I had a. a, a an unexpected trip to the Lake of the Ozarks. And I was so excited to be back to the Ozarks. that It's such a beautiful country in Missouri, uh, middle Missouri, mid Missouri. And I was asked to come. There was a speaker that had uh, an emergency medical situation. And so I got called the day before and, and flew out and just had a, a great time working with uh, a, lots of project managers in in mid missouri was loved it absolutely loved it well that's fantastic and uh, welcome back from the land of the ozarks uh, or lake of the ozarks excuse me yeah i guess it is the land of the ozark mountains right uh which is uh i mean you started your career there in in arkansas right there uh, right doing the north, just thing. north of arkansas yeah uh, in missouri oh that's in branson missouri yeah 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 it's just a few miles from the arkansas border and it is you know ozarks is a kind of an americanized version of french ozarks which is of the rainbows so i don't know if you've, you think about that french a u x a r c s but we we we, we pronounce it ozarks yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I learned something new every day from you, Spencer, and I'm looking forward to another educational session here with you today. We're talking about an interesting topic that popped up in my email inbox, uh, you know, because we both subscribe to Harvard Business Review and this thing showed up. It was uh, entitled Project Managers Unlock the Power of Time Boxing by Mark Zhao Sander. And uh uh, I was interested in this because, you know, I come from an agile background, uh, for software development, but the, but the, the, the concept of time boxing is much broader than just agile. And I would also say that, you know, it doesn't, I, when we say project managers, well, we're all kind of project managers in our own way. Right. So Absolutely. even if we don't have project manager in the title and the job title, uh, we all perform some of these functions of, of project management. Yeah. I mean, if you're listening to this and you think, well, this is a, this is a, an episode just for project managers. Well, every single one of us is a project manager. If you're an attorney, you have cases that you manage. Well, that's a project. If you are a, a director of films, well, that's, you know, those are individual projects. If you're balancing your checkbook that's a that's a project right any and and i though don't have the the title of project manager i have managed many complex and and big projects over my life and as you have as well and you just mentioned my my career in in the ozarks well some of the first big projects i managed were the development of of an imax theater and then the operation of that and there's so many different strata or levels of, of, of projects that this topic would, you know, really, uh, I think is something that's really important. And I spend a lot of time coaching leaders, not just project managers, leaders, uh, about this idea. How do you use this idea of time boxing to, to improve your, your performance? Well, why don't we get into it and, you know, probably describe, I guess, at the beginning for everyone, just so we're operating from a we're operating from a common baseline of knowledge here. What exactly is time boxing? Well, go ahead. Well, <laughs> yeah, the article rightly points out that um, you know it really has a couple of different meanings for people depending on your industry. So, me coming from a software uh, environment, 
uh, agile software development environment. Uh, time boxing is a concept that is that is common to most uh, agile software development methodologies. And the concept is you have a specific period of time in order to do something and you focus on that one thing during that time period, whether it's having uh, uh, you know, the various meetings uh, you know, that are associated with Agile or Scrum, uh, where where you you're going over your various activities or you're doing retrospectives or so, whatever you allocate a certain amount of time to those whether it's a 15 minute time block or it's an hour or four hours and that's the amount of time that you have and you focus on that one thing during that time period and and that concept doesn't just apply to software development but it can also apply to anything that we do you know in our own personal productivity or managing our teams being able to to say okay we're going to take a certain period of time 30 minutes an hour whatever it is and this is what we're going to do in that time period and that's it we're not going to get distracted by other things that might pop up you know we can park those and we can discuss those in a separate time but in this particular meeting at this particular moment we're going to focus on this one thing and that's it so so there's there's two definitions. One that you just talked about is <clears throat> kind of the applied to a, an agile environment where there's actually you're you're codependent. You're working with other members of that team, and that requires some certain things to happen for you to to to, to break out those times. We'll talk about that. And then you mentioned really the there, there's more of a a personal uh, approach to time boxing. You and I are actually time boxing right now with this with this podcast, we are, we have dedicated time. We've set it aside and we're, we're doing nothing else. That's actually an example of time boxing. So let's talk about Christian, how I, as an individual leader in my business, CEO, uh, vice president, manager, project manager, how do I use time boxing to advance my, my career? Well, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting with with time boxing is uh, when you set aside specific time, say on your calendar, I'm going to book time on my calendar to do this one thing, whatever it is. You know, maybe maybe I time box uh, responding to emails in the morning to 30 minutes, and I actually book on my calendar. I got 30 minutes to answer emails. When that's done, it's done. I don't go, I move on to the next thing. Even if, okay, I've got 400 emails on my inbox. If I don't do the time boxing, what are the ramifications of that? I become the prisoner of the moment. I'm captive to my inbox. I spend all day answering emails. I'm not really focusing on the things that were really important to me. What time boxing allows us to do is it allows us to estimate the level of effort that's required to do something, plan that time accordingly, and prioritize. Right. Okay, I, I'm going to take this time and I'll focus on this thing, which is a priority for me. And then I have the remainder of my day to do the other things. But I need to make sure that I formalize you know, the time to focus on the things that I do that are priorities. One of the, one of the recommendations that is made in the article is, hey, if you need to find an accountability partner and actually schedule the time with them right so, so they they hold so, you, they hold your feet to the fire you know so you well, don't so let important. it i mean it, and here's why cuz if you are just making an appointment with yourself there's an opportunity for you to cheat on that right so for example if the time boxing is i am going to for example you know i just got a a, a new book and uh, you know i'm always reading great books and <clears throat> and I've used a lot of the principles in this. This is traction. This is great for, for business. Well, when am I going to find time to read that? Well, if I put on, if I actually put it on my calendar, I, I will do it. If I make that a priority, as you talk about, I put it on, on my calendar. But then what's to say that I'm not going to allow another, if I have deemed that to be a priority, something else is not going to uh, take over. Somebody else's priority might might take over and, and invade my my space that I've set aside for myself. And so having an accountability partner is like showing up, inviting someone to go to the gym with you. You're much more likely to actually go and exercise if you know somebody's counting on you to be there. And so that's the the concept of, of an accountability partner. 
you know, I, I love this idea of, you know, whether you call it time blocking or, or time boxing, making appointments to do certain tasks. And I've, I, I do this all the time. So, for example, I'm getting ready to do uh, a, a board retreat with an organization up at the, the homestead. And so part of my life is if I don't put aside time specifically on my calendar for that, my, my priorities will be subordinated to other my clients or anybody else's need for to, to meet with me. And this is important because I have a calendar that is actually open to my clients to book. Now, the same is true if, if I'm working in an office. My calendar is open to other people to interrupt me. And how do they do that? They walk by my cubicle, they walk by my office, and they interrupt and say, have you got a minute? But if, if I have a calendar that is actually public within the workplace, in, in, in many ways, we get to use this method to force people to use our calendar to actually find time to interrupt us in a time that we allow those interruptions to take place. I don't know if that's making sense, but to well, me, it makes it's complete so sense. Important. It makes complete sense. Because you know, so many people are complaining of, of all the interruptions they have. They don't have time to get the work done of the work. Well, schedule that work that you have to do, and then those are times when you're actually not available. I, professors have what is called office hours, right? That's when they're available for anybody to drop by. The same thing can be done in the workplace. You can say, listen, I am, unless it's an emergency, because we're talking, you know, that's a priority, right? If it's an emergency that needs to be done now, then interrupt me. <clears throat> if it's not, if it's a priority that has a, a, a timetable, then schedule that time to talk with me about it at a time that I'm actually available that, and, and you are available. Yeah. And, the, and I would say adding to that Spencer, you know, depending, I, I too have an open calendar and depending yeah. on the kind of interaction, uh, I actually have different calendars or um, different links that only have certain dates and times or days of the week and times that are set aside for that purpose. So for example, uh, this podcast, we typically do it on Tuesdays, right? So Tuesdays kind of block for that. I have another podcast that I do, uh, but I only have uh, three days of the week that are available for that podcast. So I, I don't let anybody book me on Tuesdays because Tuesdays are typically busier for me. And I don't let anybody book me on Fridays because Fridays I use for other things. So the slots that are available to them are Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I also say, well, I need time to prepare and I need time afterwards. I don't want to be in a situation where I feel like uh, I'm too cramped in my schedule. So I make sure my calendar understands that so I, I don't get back-to-back -back meetings where I'm just running from one to another right away. Uh, I have time blocked in between. And these are simple things that you can do to take control of your time. Now, you mentioned something, Spencer, I think is really important, where, which is there may be something that be, you know comes along that is super high priority and you got to make a change. You, you have to have some flexibility. I mean, we know that. You know, the time boxing is great and, and we need it, but there are, you know, emergencies happen and sometimes you need to, you need to make a change. One of the things that's referenced in the article uh, is that Eisenhower matrix or that Covey matrix, right? Where on one yeah, axis- I always used to think it was Stephen have, Covey, but it's, uh, it is, yeah. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower well, came up with it. Yeah. You have on one axis, you have importance and on the other axis, you have urgency. And the nice thing about that is it gives you a little framework for decision making in the moment, right? So if something does pop up, you can make a rational, logical uh, decision by looking at it and say, okay, is this something that is super important and super urgent? Okay, then we need to kind of override what we got here <laughs> and we need to take care of it. Yeah, but if, you know, if you're really important, using but not urgent, then throw it on the calendar and time box it. That's right. I mean, if you're using Kanban or or rapid, you know, application de development or Scrum, I mean, those are the the urgent and important are the things that you are doing right now that get on your calendar. If it's important, 
but not urgent, that's those are planning phases. Those are preparation. Those are those are times that, that are so, so important that actually help us to reduce the amount of emergencies and urgencies that we have. So we need to find time to on our calendar to actually begin transitioning into more important but not urgent. And that's hard for a lot of people. A lot of my clients are stuck in the urgent and important quadrant. And that's where burnout happens because they're constantly reacting. They're constantly doing and, and they have no time to think, no space in between meetings, as you've talked about. When you start to get control of your of, of your life, you are planning for, you know, for these eventualities, planning to actually think and decompress and, and evaluate how did that project go? What did I do well? What could I do better? And that means you need to have space. And if you, you know, look at my calendar right now, I, I plan that. I I, I block out times when I know I need to I need to be driving somewhere. I need to be thinking and preparing. Like right before here, I had I had time where I could get my thoughts together and get prepared for our conversation. That is planned. It's on my calendar. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. You know, one of the things, Spencer, that I I think that throws people off more than any other, at least for me is it's it's not hard to focus on important urgent things if they are interesting <laughs> yep but it sometimes is hard to focus on important thir- urgent things if they're not interesting or sometimes we are we will exceed our time box because we are engrossed in something that is important and urgent and we, and we will just die. Like you could take that book traction and maybe you time box and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to set aside an hour and I'm going to, I'm going to read and, you know, I'm going to spend an hour reading this, but you get so into it. You read it for 10 hours. Like you just go because it's so interesting and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what happens is all the other things that you were supposed to be doing, you don't do because you're just so interested in this one thing. And, and this happens to me. I, 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 I will, I will say, okay, I need to do this, but that thing is boring. I don't want to do it. I'd much rather think about this and I will end up kind of justifying in my own mind. Well, I really need to spend the time thinking about this. But in the end, it's real. It's just because it's super interesting to me, as opposed to some of the other stuff that might be a little bit more mundane or boring. But it's important and it's urgent and it's got to get done. And I push it off because I just I'm more attracted to the shiny object over here. Yeah, you know, and and this is this is a um, an admission on my part of of guilt. I have been working on writing a book and. And it's probably 75% uh, where I want the, the, the first draft to be. But it is something that I have procrastinated a great deal. Why? Because I can find so many other things. I mean, writing the book requires some, some serious focus and, and just, you know, not talking to clients or, or getting the work done. There's so many other priorities that, 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 that preempt that. And so, one of the ways most everybody listening is probably doing some form of time blocking already. That's time boxing. That's, that's just normal. But to really get good at it is to look at something that you have been procrastinating, like in my case, this book, and put, even if it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes on the calendar where you're going to focus on something. And as you said, sometimes what it takes is just, and so here's the second skill to, to time box, create an accountability partner. So you actually show up for that meeting. And what will happen is, is you'll actually get started and you'll create some momentum and maybe keep going a little bit longer. Not a, not a bad thing as, as well. But the key is, is if there's something that you are putting off that needs to be done, get it on the calendar, put, make an appointment with yourself to focus on whatever it is that you're procrastinating, put it on there for 30 minutes, 15 minutes, even an hour that specifically you need to work on 
and uh, and then make that appointment with somebody. That's a th- that's one of the things that is going to treat that appointment seriously, and that's going to help you break through that procrastination to get that that project done that is important but not urgent. You know, one other hack. It's a simple hack, but I think it's fun. Uh, so there's a there's a speaker uh, out of out of uh, Boston. His name is Mike Savage. He's also a coach for entrepreneurs and things. And and I actually um, had him as a coach in the past. Uh, and and he's and he's fantastic. One of the things that he told me was that uh, whenever he had a, a coaching session, a few minutes before that session, he would play to himself ACDC's Thunderstruck. <laughs> Why? Because that song would get him in a mindset. Absolutely. And sometimes when we have something that's time boxed that we, we've got so much going on in our brains, it becomes hard to focus. One simple hack you can do is when you are ready to get into that time box activity is just play a tune that's going to get you in the right mindset. So whether it's Thunderstruck, I, I laughed about Thunderstruck because uh, someone that I work with in the International Olympic Committee, who is the head of uh, N- what's called NOC Services, so National Olympic Committee Services, uh, before marching the athletes and his team on the field for the opening ceremony, he blasts this tune, Thunderstruck, every time to just get everybody in the right mindset. And uh, so, you know, whatever tune it is that's going to get you focused, you know, you see it with athletes all the time, right? You see, you see cameras on them in the locker room. They've got headphones on. They're listening to something, right? That is just getting them in the right mindset to perform at their very best. And we can do the same thing. You know, we can we can use that kind of music to inspire us and focus us. <laughs> you know, whatever. It, it, my son does this when he's going in to, to do a, a, a sale or a close. Um, but he does something different, not listening to a song, but he, in, in high school, he won a, uh, his team, his volleyball team won the state championship in, in Nevada in 2018. And so one of the things that he does is he grabs a volleyball, he physically grabs a volleyball and he, and he, and he smacks it on the ground like he used to do in practice. And it just gets him his whole mind in a body in a state of, of energy and enthusiasm. And it's something that is so important. Our body informs our mind how we are to think and act and, and, and behave. And so often we think it's always just the, the, the mind that is in control of the body. But sometimes just getting your, your body moving and listening to that music is telling your brain, this is what's important right now and you're excited to do it. And it's going to increase your chances of, of doing it. Now I have a question for you. So there's a couple things that, you know, time boxing is an is a important skill for project managers and, and, and everybody but it it mirrors project management because you have to take into account some things that that you're working on so for example the the scope of the project what is the purpose what's the outcome what's going to be accomplished and and how much you know what are the resources that are going to be involved and you know, how much time how you know how much how much money is it is it is it going to cost you and so some of you say well you know how do we how do we determine how much money the project costs well how much do you? How much are you worth? What 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 is your what is your salary? What is your time worth? And how many hours is it going to take? So my question to you is: How do you determine how long a project's going to take? Like, I'm writing this book. How long is it? You know, do I? How do I estimate that? How? What have you done? Uh, well, there are a variety of methods. Uh, number one, if you've done it before, then you know. <laughs> but number two is if you haven't done it before then talk to people who've done it before. Do some benchmarking, you know. Uh, so, you know, we do that in, in in an Olympic space all the time. You know, if you're looking at budgets, for example, you're not just coming out of, uh, with numbers out of thin air, but you're going to benchmark against previous so cities. So, so benchmarking is really, really great. See, you know, talk to people and see, well, how much time does it typically take for you? Gather as much of that information as you possibly can. Uh, and, 
you know, you may have some formal estimation tools, whether they're spreadsheets or they're, you know, there's some software that's specifically designed for this, or you can, you can put in various parameters and it can help calculate for you the project duration, depending on the number of the tasks, the type of tasks and the level of effort required and the dependencies and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, software tools can certainly help, but, you know, my, my personal view is, is, is talk to people. <laughs> You know, gather information from them and, and, you know, see, so, so you want to write a book, a book, write to someone else who's taught, who's written a book. How yeah. long did it take you? How many so, chapters? I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of professional speakers have written books. So have conversations with them. I'm sure you have done that already, right? Yep. Where, okay, well, how long did it take you to write it? And how did, you know, what was the process and the steps and so on and so forth. And I mean, there's a treasure trove of information also online that you can do research to help, you know, so, so, uh, you know, don't just come up with these numbers in a vacuum, but, but, uh, you know, sanity check that stuff with people that, you know, and trust. Yeah. I mean, because you, you want to, you want to realistically know how much time you have to plan out into, into the future. You're not going to do it all today or, you know, all at once. So you talked about priorities. Well, then how do you determine which of those, you know, quadrants the, the priority is, is it urgent and important? Is it important, but you know, what do you do with the, with the tasks that fall in those different quadrants? What have you d done that's worked, Christian? Uh, Am I putting you, know, you on the spot when, here? When you say this, it makes me laugh because, and, and the reason why I chuckle a little bit is it sounds easy, <laughs> but we are human beings with malleable computers up here. And we can convince ourselves that something is important and urgent when really it's not important or urgent, or it might be important, but it's not urgent, or it's urgent, but not important. So we, we oftentimes can convince ourselves that everything is urgent and important. And, and so, you know, for me, it's like, like, I would take a step back. Okay. I ask myself questions like, what happens if I don't do this today? I do it tomorrow. Who's impacted? What are those impacts? If I don't do it right now, yeah. I do it later. What is the impact going to be? You know, now it might be that, well, the impact might be, there's a, you know, the customer's impatient and they might, they might, you know, they might send a follow-up email. Okay. Well, is that the end of the world? Is it okay if I get a follow-up email? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, you know? So, you know, putting it together some kind of a, a, a simple Q and A, framework in your own mind to help you more rationally decide what is urgent and important. I think, I, I think it's helpful because oftentimes we're, we're driven by emotion and we might think to ourselves, we might, we might, we might tell this story to ourselves. If I don't answer this email today, the client is going to fire me. My family's not going to be fit. I'm going to lose my house. Right? So, Oh my gosh, I have to do this right now. And the reality may be that, and it might be something else. It might be different, you know. Yeah, we, we, we tend to uh, awfulize and, and catastrophize and, and make things more urgent than, than they actually are. I find that sometimes, you know, people say, well, I have to respond to every email and every, every phone call, you know, sometimes just being available all the time is, uh, is not in your favor. If you're busy and people have to actually work to get on your calendar, they're going to value your time more. And that is even with, with clients. I mean, my clients know that, I mean, I just had somebody today ask if they could reschedule at a certain time. Well, I'm not available. But I will do everything I can to to work you in when uh, when my calendar allows. It says that that I'm in demand and I'm you know I'm I'm focused on on priorities and it it creates um, scarcity can can create greater demand and value. And so don't be you know don't be you know I know a lot. We, we, you talked about speakers. <laughs> Someone reaches out to you for a speaking event. You want to obviously get back to them pretty quickly. But you don't have to, you know, every second, there's, there's a lot of competition out there. They might go to someone else faster. But if you are somebody that is quality and in demand and they want you, 
uh, if you don't get back to them in, in five minutes, it'll be okay. So a couple of ways to determine if something truly is urgent is, is it an emergency? You know, is there a, uh, you said who's involved and in, in, is it something, is somebody going to be hurt? Is somebody's business going to be impacted? Is the project going sideways? You know, is there a broken, you know, is, is the electrical line down and, and people can't work? So you need to get that fixed. Is there a, a water pipe that's broken? Obviously we need to take care of that, but if there's an urgent client request that truly is urgent, that's something that's got to be dealt with now. Is there a last-minute due date that was unexpected? Those are things that are going to be um, that that need to be done now. But what about the important but not urgent? How do you how do you determine that? Well, if it if it if it's important but not urgent. It's basically answering that question, does it have to be addressed immediately, right? Yep. Uh, so it can be high impact, but it doesn't have to have high urgency. So it could be a situation, for example, uh, you know, we're in the process of uh, with a client of going through user acceptance testing. And sometimes we have to fix something that we have to fix immediately because it's simply not working. Oh, well, this is broken and we cannot continue with the testing until this thing is fixed. Okay. So we need to, we need to put it some time. Our developers need to, to make a focus on getting this done so we can continue with the rest of the testing. You know, then you might have a situation where uh, during that testing, the client finds, Oh, you know what? The software is doing this. It's, it's giving me approved or not approved, but it's not giving me any distinction between whether it's been rejected or the person just hasn't yet approved it. It's just saying not approved. We need to fix that. Okay, that's fine. We can fix that, but you can go ahead and do the rest of your testing. We'll, we'll take that in and we will, we will build that feature and okay, developers, how long is that going to take? Well, it might take uh, three days. Okay. So, uh, We'll get that scheduled and three days we'll be ready to do that part of you know, we'll create a new script for that and you'll be able to conduct that part of the test. So that's an important thing, but it wasn't super urgent because it wasn't it wasn't prohibiting anybody from doing anything else. They can continue just kind of going on doing the rest of the stuff. And then when we can have it ready, it's ready. And now uh, everybody can proceed and, and take care of that thing. So I don't know if that really answers the question, but I, I just feel like if it's something that is actually showstopper i'm stuck i can't do anything here until i get unstuck then it's important and urgent that we need to address it that being said sometimes you you get stuck but the solution to getting unstuck might be a week it might be two weeks because it requires a decision to be made from somebody you know up here at the c-suite level or whatever yeah. and they're not going to decide until they have their board meeting on the 12th and so you have to wait until the 12th you know for the and there's nothing else you can do okay you know so so some of the urgency is not necessarily in your control because the solution to the problem may be out of your control and then you just have to deal with that and you have to plan around that uh, but if the urgency is in your control and it's super important okay take care of it if not then schedule it Take care of it. Yeah, and there, there's some other there, there's some other criteria for identifying important but not urgent. So, for example, your long term goals, maybe that's something that you want to develop. Uh, uh, you want to advance your career, so you want to develop some skills, and that could be going back and getting certifications, right? So, scheduling time for certifications again, important but not urgent, and that's related to a long term goal. Also, things like um, long-term project planning. What you know? What do we need for future capabilities, manpower, uh, expertise? You know, what kinds of things are we going to need in in the future? I'll give you an example of something that um, is maybe a maintenance issue for me. So I have a, a, a database, right, of um, of clients keeping that constantly up to date. That's a maintenance issue. You know, you need to schedule time to make sure that that's accurate. And even my, my email campaigns that go out for my customers, those need to be updated with 
with the latest information. That is something that's never urgent, but it's important. And I want, I want the emails to go out are, to be reflective of, of, of my experience and my knowledge. And so sometimes I need to, I need to schedule time for those type of maintenance issues. Um, networking. You know, going to events like, you know, we go to the National Speakers Association, you, you, you're, you're a member of other networking meetings. Building your, your network is something that is important but not urgent. And so sometimes we will cannibalize our time by, by not going to those, those events and, you know, but, but by scheduling them and, and making an appointment with someone else to, to keep that, that, uh, that appointment is something that's going to really pay dividends in your career and life. Thoughts that, that you have on that? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, last week is a good example. I was not able to go to the NSA Mount West chapter meetings. Why? Because the following morning, I had a big kickoff meeting with the IOC uh, for integration, and we had a tremendous amount of work to do uh, for the International Olympic Committee uh, to prepare for that meeting. And I... I had to focus on that. You know, we had to be ready uh, for that meeting the following morning. And, uh, you know, I spent all day working on it. And I just, we, I, we were not in a position uh, for me to step away from that go to, to go do that other thing. And so I had to make a choice and I had to choose the urgent thing over the important but uh, not urgent thing. And, you know, that sometimes it's it's hard. You know, you, you have to do those things and you have to make those choices. I mean, just like what you, you were talking about with your book, right? Uh, yeah. It's an important but not an urgent thing because it's part of your long-term goal, as you were talking about, to do this. And, and there's a challenge there because when it's important but not urgent, we can push it off by more urgent things. And so we we have to find ways to maintain that discipline so that we can we can accomplish those important but not urgent things. Otherwise, they'll never happen. <laughs> we'll just keep shoving them down the road because too many other urgent things are demanding our attention. So just a, a few more things on priority. What do we do with those things that are uh, urgent but not important, according to the Eisenhower matrix? Because, again, we're, this all ties into time blocking, right? <laughs> well, uh, not to digress too much, but tomorrow, you and I and Patrick have something that is important and not urgent, but I'm making it urgent, and that is, in, and that is going to visit our favorite haunt, uh, uh, red iguana, uh, to have some delicious mole. That's an important, but not an urgent thing, but what do That's we right. do? So we if put you're going to be calendar. in red iguana tomorrow at 1130, come by and, and say hi to Christian Patrick and I, because, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we love, we've been doing, how many years have we been doing this now? Oh my gosh. It's been almost 20 years, I guess, you know? Yeah. Since, I mean, they they since have some incredible this. Mexican food that we absolutely love. And, and there's a, a, a enchiladas uh amarillas that is just really to die for it's got yeah, incredible they're amazing they're amazing that's an example <laughs> of something that's important but not urgent right right it's, it's important it's for us to maintain those friendships and to stay connected yeah. uh but we have flexibility on the timing so when is it that we can all get together and do this okay we find a time and then we do it you know and then that's and and you're very busy and you said i've got one day that i can do it and it's Wednesday. So you That's made right. the time. <laughs> That's the only You made I mean, the time. And say, okay. All right. Spencer, and, and we're going to It's hard to turn you. down mole for <laughs> sure. But but I think one of the things that we need to look at, Patrick, is uh, excuse me, Patrick. I used to had him in my mind, Chris. I know who you are. Uh, it is if it's not important, or, or excuse me, if, if if it's important but not urgent, then delegate it. Um you know, so some things that you can, that's that quadrant three, right? It's, it's, it, uh, what, what is that? So ur urgent, but not important. Sorry. And that is, you know, you, you delegate those out. Maybe there's some things that you have to do re re reports. Just if you have the ability to have a, a, a team member, give, I, I was talking to one of my, uh, coaching one of my, my clients and, and they were, they were saying that, their boss gives them everything that they don't want to do. <laughs> and, 
and I had to giggle because I remember my mentor, uh, Kelvin, who I talk about almost every show, used to say to me, your job, Spencer, is to make my job easier. And at first, when I, you know, I was young, I thought that was pompous and arrogant and, and condescending. It, it is absolutely true. If you as a consultant on, on the Salt Lake Organizing Committee or the IOC are not making people's lives better and easier because of the work that you do and, and the focus that you bring, uh, they don't need you. And, and, and the same is true of, of, of me and my direct reports. If there's someone on my team that is making my life more complicated and difficult, I don't need them on my team. So your job is to, is to make you know, your, your boss's job, life better. So take those things that, that they don't want to do or that they don't consider to be their strengths. And uh, that's, that's something you, you get to do as a manager is delegate some of those things that maybe you don't love to do or you're, you're not the best at. So I have a thought on this, Spencer. Good. It comes back to my background in technology and going all the way back to the 1990s when we were implementing systems for motorcycle the dealers. last century? Yeah, back in the 90s, pre-Y2K, you know, when we were... Well, replacing all of our systems to make them Y2K compliant <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, back then, the 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 conventional wisdom, which I think was correct, was you buy a system for two reasons. One is to increase your efficiency, yep. so you can do more and less, and you get you increase your profitability, and you can do it, do it better. And then two is to improve your decision making because you're getting more inputs, you're getting a more accurate picture of what's really going on in your business so that you can make better, more well-informed decisions. And if a system is accomplishing these two goals, if it's making your business more efficient and it's helping you making better decisions, then it's worth the cost of the implementation. And that seems like, okay, that's, that makes sense. It's intuitive. Take that same view and apply it to your team. Is your team helping you run more efficiently and make better decisions? You know, so when you talk about your job is to make my job easier, right? <laughs> it's the same as, as employing a, a technology solution, you know, throwing Oracle or or SAP or whatever it is that you're using, you know, Microsoft 365, you know, whatever it is, whatever technology suite you're using, is this suite increasing my efficiency, improving my decision making? Yes, it is. Okay, then it's worth it. Is my team increasing our collective and individual efficiencies? And are we improving our decision making? Yes, we are. Great. If it's not, then your team's not generating the value it needs to be generating. Right. And there is, there is nothing condescending about that. Teams exist to produce results. Members on the team, same thing. We're all about getting things done. Well, I think, you know, we, we've, I, there's one more thing I want to talk about uh, from my perspective. You may have something else to talk about. But if you're listening to this and you still haven't, been you're not sold on the concept of of learning the skill of time boxing there are predictions you know gartner for example predicts that by 2030 80 percent of all projects will be managed by ai you talk about systems that are helping get things done faster and, and more effectively and efficiently uh, AI and generative AI is, is really starting to do that and really impacting the project management field right now. It's a hot, hot topic. And uh, it, it's something that a lot of project managers are concerned about. And, and, and lots of people are. One of the skills that will help you to be more valuable in the future is really how you manage your time and use your time. And that is time boxing. So that's a skill that is future-proofing of your career and helping you to, to compete against the technologies. As I understand, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I agree 100%. And, uh, you know, time stating the obvious here. I mean, there are only so many seconds in the minute and minutes in an hour and hours in a day and days in a year. Right. So the more 
effectively we can manage that not just so we're productive but we also feel fulfilled you know i think it's absolutely essential because uh at the end of the day uh you know we we need to find a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and we need to we need to set aside the time to feed our souls as well as get all the work done that we need to do and you know ai may be super helpful in that respect in terms of helping us uh, reduce the time that it takes to do certain tax uh, tasks so that we can spend uh, more time uh, serving others and doing things that are going to enrich us you know and and those things again uh, will be super beneficial if we time box them my son is very very good at this uh, he's a he's a spreadsheet lover and 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 he does this on Excel and he makes sure that he he puts in plenty of time for recreational activities whether it's you know playing video games online with his friends or it's reading or whatever it is he makes sure to block that out you know it's not just about blocking out the things that i you know the tasks that i need to do but he also blocks out time for things that will enrich him uh you know individually or help him to to uh strengthen connections and relationships with other people yeah. so it, this it's is, absolutely what vital is skill so so important because what happens i hear so many people say i'm i'm overwhelmed and life is just you're allowing life to just kind of control you and take over the the skill to regain control of of your life is is one of those is this is this skill here because you are making time for the things that are important that feed your soul like you said instead of reacting and responding to everybody else's priorities you are managing theirs along with yours and there's so many tools and ways to do that and i think we've just scratched the surface on on this subject christian but i i really thank you for for bringing it up as a as a skill that we need to discuss because it is, it is important and, and it is absolutely a crucial to our our careers so um any any last thoughts that that you have uh happy halloween i guess we'll talk uh I, I, our next segment actually will be on halloween itself so uh yeah uh <laughs> looking forward to that spencer a, i appreciate you a special you. guest right coming you want to talk we about do that? we do we have uh we have a special guest joining us all the way from the uk who he is doing fantastic things uh his goal in life his mission his purpose is to reduce the failure rate of startups, you know, because wow. so many startups fail in the first five years and he's kind of taking it on himself saying, I'm going to fix that. We're going to make that better. And it really comes down to people and skills. And he's got some really innovative ways to help startups build teams that can create and drive successful business. And so I'm super excited to have uh, my friend Paul join us. Um, uh, next week on our show. So looking forward to that. Wonderful. Well, what, so you bring so much value to, to organizations with what you're doing. It's why you're, you're in demand right now as a consultant. And so how do people get a hold of you, Christian? Uh, just uh, look me up on LinkedIn, looked up Christian Napier. I'm happy to connect with people. So please uh, do so. I'm, I, I love connecting with new people and getting to know people and Spencer, you're helping folks everywhere. <laughs> I mean, you were in Indonesia. You were uh, in the Lake of the Ozarks last week. You're you're all over the place helping people to build high performing teams and become the best leaders they can be. If uh, people want to learn more about the things that you do to help and serve others, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. Connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you're going to be in Ottawa, November 22nd and 23rd. Uh, and Montreal, 24th through 25th. I'm going to be there. I'm actually going to be there over Thanksgiving. We're going to do our Thanksgiving early, so uh, American Thanksgiving, that is. So if you're in those areas, I'd love to see you. Uh, is I, it, it's taking me as long to get to Ottawa as it is to like get to Europe. I mean, it, it's it's like 12 hours of flying. Got to go all over the place to to get to Ottawa. It's really crazy from from here. So that's my, that's my next big trip, but that I'm excited about. Well, that's amazing. So if folks uh, catch Spencer there in, in Canada, 
over the American Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, the Canadians, our friends, uh, already had their Thanksgiving. I think they yes, celebrated they it recently. And uh, listeners, viewers, thank you so much for spending an hour with us today. We really appreciate it. Please like and subscribe to our podcast. We'll catch you again soon.